This is Anne Ellsworth um, speaking with Sophia Komen on May, what is the date? May 13th, 2020, um, the day after a, a recording we did of. Uh, so, Sophia, I'll let you introduce the piece. Oh, the, the piece we did is called Sanctity and Shifting. It is a 14 movement graphically notated piece. And yeah, it was really exciting. <laughs> Super good. Okay, so, and we recorded it at a Memorial Chapel on the Lawrence University campus, and um, it was just one performer. I was the only performer, and uh, Sophie was the only audience member. Yep. <laughs> in lockdown from this um, pandemic. And uh, Alvina and uh, Brent, the school engineers, were there to videotape it and to also uh, do an audio recording. So, um, uh, so, if you want to give just a little overview of like what my instructions were, not 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 specifically in the score, but like that we weren't really supposed to talk about it in advance. Yeah. So the way that I wrote this piece, I wrote it at a time when I wasn't feeling too great, and I wrote it all very very fast, and I realized with the notational parameters that I was using. I was not going to have almost any control over what my performers did. So I decided to play to the strengths of that sort of setup by specifically writing essentially a blank slate for the performer to really make their own and just essentially give them like different channels through which they could express themselves. So the, the piece, while it is very like, extensively notated and has a lot of instructions and text and all sorts of different things in it, there is almost no actual instruction as to what those things mean. And that's of course intentional, but um, it is also comes with the instruction that you're not to rehearse it um, and that the only time you're actually to play it is in a performance setting or in like a meaningful setting. And so all the rehearsal work that you did was um, uh, off instrument pretty much and just conceptual, which is good. Uh, it also comes with a sort of like expiration date clause where you're not supposed to perform it more than a couple of times because I don't want the performer to learn the piece to the point where they know what they're going to do because then you lose that entire element of spontaneity. So, and because of course of the way it was written, I knew exactly how I would perform it as a, com but I will never perform it for that reason. And so sitting in the audience was really special for me because I both knew what was going on and I had absolutely no idea what was going on. So yeah, it was, it was really, it was really great. And you did a fantastic job. And oh, thanks. Thanks. Well, uh, well, okay, good. And I really had no idea what I was going to do. Um, we spoke, for a minute uh, after it was over, mm -hmm. and you said you wanted to maybe ask me about what I was thinking, what my process was. Yeah, I it watching something like that is so fascinating because like I could tell that there was something going on. You know, it's like which is why I think I I I set the piece up like I did because like you can tell when there's something going on and when there's nothing going on and I could tell there was something going on. I just don't know what and that's what I was so curious about. Well, um, well, and just ask the follow-up questions because I, yeah, um, you introduced me to the score. It was uh, in the fall. I can't remember. It was spring term of last year. Term. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I was looking at it thinking, oh, God, let's talk about something going on. And I, of course, I have no idea. And I, you promised that you were never going to tell me, or maybe until I was done performing the piece. Oh, yeah. Once, once you're done with it, then I'll tell you what I, what I baked into it. But <laughs> so I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, okay, so I could spend the rest of my life trying to analyze this, or I could just try and the first time I looked at it, I felt like something is, I felt like it really resonated. Like, I have no idea what this is, but uh, this is really interesting. I would really like to do this. So, um, yeah. And then we, we, we kind of circled back to it and, um, and I started reading it again as if, okay, we're going to really perform this now. And, um, so the instructions, the, the thing is it's in 14 movements mm -hmm. and, um, 
I see that there's a lot of geometry in the instructions. I see a lot of uh, uh, beautiful images. And then the text is, um, it each each movement is like in in a really, I want to say extreme mental space or emotional space. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and each one is so different from from any of the others. And you've got some of these that are just back to back, which remind me very much of those like uh, that like thing they used to do in um, like Italian, like like Monteverdi, like have these drastic mood changes, like back to back. That is in the one is like a taka, you know. But I still felt like I had to be able to like shift gears in between, and so I thought, how am I going to do that? How am I going to go from like one extreme to the next extreme? So I thought about maybe. Um, uh, like sitting down and kneeling and um, which was brilliant by the way because like I, I specified that I wanted there to be like some sort of visual aspect and I like completely hadn't thought of sort of having them be like branching out from like a central point of stasis which I suppose for a performer perspective makes so much sense because you have to cover so much emotional ground but even just from like a visual perspective it really like tied the the piece together in a way that i really hadn't anticipated and i really appreciated oh, cool. that you that you brought that to the table cool well i i um yeah so i'm looking at the at this visuals and there's a lot of circles i mean the circles sort of the main the, the most common um uh geometric shape that i'm seeing in the in the score and so I decided to make a circle out of my horns around me and sit in the middle of it. And then the alphorn, of course, comes across as these lines that I could use to like bisect. And I mean, I, even to the point that I just thought of that as a line, even more than an instrument. I, because I couldn't fully understand the uh, geometry, because I couldn't fully understand what was going on. I mean, it's really complicated um, in, a, in a perfectly fine way. And, and honestly, given the parameters that you described, I, it's clear that not only did I not have to understand it, I just had to um, perform it. Perform it exactly. <laughs> and so, in, in, a, in the sense of like someone reading like Sartre who doesn't speak French, or, you know what I mean? Like for me, yeah. like wow, this is really beautiful. These letters that go by, I just decided to um, try and embody it because I couldn't, in, I couldn't uh, absorb it intellectually. So I just made these circles. And I tried to make, sort of inhabit the. Uh, the geometry of the score. And then, um, and I kind of thought through, in the score it has like, it can be up to five players. And for a single person to play a full unaccompanied piece, um, I don't know, <laughs> there's something I like to call horn fatigue. That oh yeah. I'll have to do it on one like horn and I don't know, that's a long thing and I, I just, I, for myself, I read the, the quality of the voices that you wanted up to five, and I thought, dang, I mean, well, I don't, I don't have my score with me right now, but do you have your score? Your oh, score? no, I don't. But um, no. essentially, to, to give a brief description of it, I set up like a set of contrasts that the performer or performers had to be able to fill, and of the various like different voice directions that the different parts of the piece would require yeah. and so it was sort of like like a mix and match instrumentation sort of found it ah good so it says a voice that can sing a voice that can scream a voice with a heartbeat a voice that can laugh and a voice that can sob yeah no pressure <laughs> <laughs> so then so then i was looking at that and i thought um okay so of my like on the horn i can think of those but I have these various instruments and um, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to try and be all five players and, and use whatever tools I have to make this thing. And so, um, and then I decided that because there was so much vocal reference, like this, the first one is um, the, the overture is um, all about creating and making something and, um, and the song and singing a melody and, a collage and it need not be perfect, which I appreciate a lot. And we should pour out all our beautiful, thick 
human darkness. And so I, I just thought about that. I thought, you know what? I've never, okay. So, and I imagine doing this in this uh, big, huge acoustic of the Memorial Chapel. And, um, you know, I've never, I've, I, I, I've never vocalized like I did that. And I, I didn't, I didn't practice it actually. Like, um, I knew that I could sing really loud. We do that in our horn lessons, right? When I talk about playing in the head voice and like, yeah. ooh, ooh, getting that sort of like, uh, singing in the mass, etc. But I kind of wanted to just, I didn't rehearse it. I didn't even sing it at home or in the shower or anything to try and just make the actually the loudest noise I could possibly make. And I was completely blown away. Like, because <laughs> you, you, your singing voice is so completely different from your speaking voice. Like you have like the, the tone of like an operatic mezzo soprano, which like does not come across in your speaking voice at all, which is why I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, and then you, you brought it back in one of the later movements as well, which was um, sort of a, a great way to reference it. So, but that time I was ready for your voice, but the first time I was like, wow. <laughs> well, and the thing is I wasn't ready for it either. And, and, and I thought of it, I thought of it like um, in terms of, you know, in the B minor mass, the, the quonium, I don't know if you know this piece, Oh yeah. <laughs> 50 minutes into this uh, in incredible work and you're hearing singers and you're hearing string players and wind players and then suddenly here's the voice of the horn and um, which is supposed to be the voice of God again like this sort of you're trying to represent something it was very specific what you're representing well then again no pressure but um, so you sit there and you come in on this high octave uh, these D's you play a D and then the octave above it and no matter how soft you're playing, it sounds so loud and it's shocking. The most difficult part about, for me, playing the B minor mass is the shock I have of hearing the horn sound after 50 minutes of not hearing it. And I yeah. wanted that to be that same sort of moment when I would like shock myself and I totally did. <laughs> and I think it went on for a little too long, maybe just because I was like, what? <laughs> what is this, you know? And trying to push my voice to the point where it would break and split. I'm not a singer, and that actually isn't my voice. That's I was just I wasn't singing. I was vocalizing, which is to me a very different thing because I wasn't trying to hit anything. I was trying to just push my head voice to the part where it would start to split. And I had I had all that stuff out, and I had my bells out, which I I thought about using the horn bells, and and I didn't. That again, that was not a decision. I was thinking of, of maybe at some point singing through the bell, the horn bell. But then I had two of them, and I was just making two of them because I wanted like the symmetry in this. I wanted the circle thing to look cool, and I spent about twenty minutes setting it up when, in advance of it, not no, not really knowing exactly what it was going to look like. And so I just reached for those two bells, and I was using the bells in my hands like those were like, and then they started to start to feel like amplifiers. I was like, I'm going for it. So that was that. That was that. And I just sang as loud as I could. That was my whole, whole process. Yeah. And it was, it was great. And like the pacing at the end too of that specific movement was also great because I was, I was thinking, it's like, how, how is she going to end it? You know, but um, to have, I suppose, I the, I the endurance, you, you trailed it off, oh. which was d difficult to do in a situation like that um of something that is like physically demanding you know what i mean um in igloo and in improvisation we the the hardest part of an improvisation is ending it mm -hmm. you know which is why for like every single like one of the pieces that you played i was watching for the end and um which was and i think well to me because i'm also an improviser i think that was the most fascinating part of the entire thing um uh, were, were the beginnings and the ends because how you got into that headspace and how you got out of it and i suppose that relates back to the whole centering thing and in that specific case there was you know you you put the bells down you recentered and then you went to putting the alphorn together which is another thing that i completely hadn't considered that when you have one person playing multiple instruments the transition from one instrument to another becomes choreography almost and the movement of putting the alphorn together is because i mean you used it in three different movements right and each time you had to move the pieces around and well two and a half um because you didn't use the whole thing in one of them right <laughs> right 
Okay, and see, this is to tell you, like, I have actually no memory of how that first movement ended, or even how it began. I just remember, I just remember the bells in my hand, and, um, and the hands, and trying to point them at the, like, the space, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't, actually don't remember how I got out of that at all. And then the, the second one, I just was, my, the, like, the, the trigger word for me and that movement was thick human darkness and i was just trying to think of something really thick and that was the thickest voice i could think of okay and then we so and then we get to um song for the dawn oh, I, I, arguably one of my favorite ones that you did that one like like grabbed me and just shook me the entire time um it was it was really it was really something what all i remember from that one is that um it was just playing the alphorn right yeah i mean it's such an amazing instrument I, that's enough see i think the thing with the alphorn is that it doesn't do very much and so it has a like a stereotype mm. not not even a stereotype it has a well i suppose it has what it plays and that is the only thing you can ever hear on the instrument mm. and you didn't play that you played something completely different to the point that except for maybe for about like 10 seconds towards the end, it didn't even sound like an alphorn. It sounded like it's like a cross between a horn and a cello, which maybe it was just where I was sitting in the audience, but, and because you don't get to hear that low register of the alphorn very often. Yeah. Um, it was just absolutely unique. And it was almost cinematic, I suppose, in the, the length of the notes and the, the depth of the notes. And I, I just felt like that was, because I mentioned after you walked off stage that there were some movements that completely aligned with the way I would have, I would have played it. Yeah. That was one of them. You know, that was, you, you hit all the concepts that I personally had for my own interpretation of that specific movement, which was really impressive to hear, you know? That's awesome. And um, I'll tell you when I, do, do you want to t you want me to say what was going on in my sure life? yeah absolutely and this is all it was just i was trying to just be in it like and see what happened um that instrument is so unwieldy as you know and so difficult to play in terms of like you know and but i i got out there and i started playing and and you know it's like the dawn and i was just thinking about that moment you know when the sun is is coming up and you'd had i can't remember what my cue sheet was uh yeah, it's just, it's a, uh, it was like a creation movement. Yes. And for me, the creation is like, there's, a, there's this, this light of the sun, which the, like the sort of, the refractions that go on in the visually, and then also like the, like water, how it moves, like this really slow wave kind yeah. of. Yeah. And the sound waves that, that I just kind of got into the sound and I did something on that point, which I have never done before. So thank you in advance for that. What? It was, I just let my, whatever note, my, I didn't try and hit anything on the album. I just started to like initiate a vibration in my mouth, like in whichever one came out was what it was. That's so crazy because when you were playing it, I, and which is why, like, when I walked up on stage to take a bow, I looked over at your sheet because I was like, did she write this out? Because, okay, what, so what happened was you played, like, two really deep notes, okay. and then you played two mid-register notes that were a minor third apart. And I went, whoa, because, you know, like, there's really only one minor third in the overtone <laughs> series, and it's not one that you ever get to hear. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when we're playing, like, horn calls, we avoid the flat seven. Yeah. And so to hear that, it, I think that's what made it sound uncharacteristic to the instrument. And just, of course, because of the, the nature of it, it sounded like almost pan diatonic in a way in that it had a very clear center. I just couldn't like place all the rest of the notes around that center, you know? It yeah. was, it was really fantastic. Oh, cool. Well, and I was just, I was just really, I was just really thinking about sound and 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 these starts and stops for the just letting the less letting the horn do what it wanted do you know what i mean i wasn't trying to control it i was just um, letting it 
speak whatever was going to happen. Um, yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you liked it. I mean, there but for the grace of God, you know, you never know. Um, so, and then uh, number three is uh, Water. It's a scherzando. And um, I played this one on my, um, my Geyer double horn. And just um, the, the, the uh, can I hold this up? Sure. Um, this is what the, what this looks like. And um, I wanted to start with, uh, I didn't know what I was thinking. I got up there and I thought, okay, water. And that's the thing when every time I was like sitting there and then I'd, I'd like change the score. And anyway, I cut out, I, you know what? So most of the scores have a circle around them. And I took some art paper and I put my, be uh, my horn bell on top of the art paper and then took a box cutter and cut around 14 layers of paper out so that I had 14 round pieces of paper um, that I could use as my score because it felt really uncomfortable when I thought about what was happening on the stage. I didn't, to use a music stand didn't seem right. And then, but to also have something rectangular when everything on that stage was either round, the only things that weren't round were the um, outhorn stems. And, and then the, you put the crook over it, right? And I put a crook over the top. Yeah, exactly. So um, anyway, so that's what I did. And I was thinking about the, the water and and I guess my first image re when I got up there, I was thinking, okay, water and it's a scary sound, it's fast. And I thought of that um, you know, in the in the Goldberg variations, there's like a there's just things even in the um, opening aria. And it's it's kind of like sort of like an ornamentation when the right hand just falls down on an arpeggio or something. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about just sort of descending things, descending things, and then I got into it. I had no idea what I was doing, and then and then I started to think, oh no, 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 because and then I remembered the the uh, graphic which I had just looked at. I don't know why I couldn't remember it. This sort of thing, and then I started looking in my mind's eye to these different uh, points of um, of intersection where these all these lines meet and are connected and so I started thinking about that and then the next thing I know it's over so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that but that one I was was interesting because like sort of a, a trope of improvising on the horn is sort of like the the noodley sound you know that we do so well and what I found fascinating about this specific one when you played it is that it was in the noodley trope but it had a scale in it, you know? I'm not sure how you did it, but like it was noodly, but it had a key, which was really interesting. And I think that's the best way I can describe it. Um, Cause I remember sitting there thinking, huh, that's, um, but like it wasn't, it wasn't, a, I think it was in like our F sharp, um, which was bizarre because that's not a particularly easy key for us to usually play in, but that's sort of where like signposts would stabilize in your playing. Um, and which is really interesting. Now that you say that, that's the um, length of the Alphorn. Exactly, which is why I was able to pick up on it. <laughs> is, what, like, because you're right, I wouldn't choose that for... Because okay. usually you'd hear F being the predominant one. Um, but I was like, nope, this, this is F sharp, you know. This... Yeah. Interesting. Okay, um, do you want to just go to the next one? Sure. Okay, and... Um, do you want to introduce this? I'm just I'm looking at this. And again, like I don't really, this I did think of in advance of what instrument I would play and what. Uh, so this one's number four. Do you want to read it? Oh yeah. Uh, this one's just called body and there's the, the graphic over there that I won't tell you what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> and um, the you want me to hold text. It oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I, I was just going to say like, I won't say like what I was thinking of when I made that picture, but um, yeah. The text just says, your body changes in many ways, find one and sing it. And this was one of the ones that like, I had absolutely no idea what anybody was going to do with. And so um, watching you did what you did, I was like, oh, of course that's what she was going to do. But it was still like in a surprising way, you know what I mean? Hmm. Well, and, and this one, um, now that I'm thinking of it, that whole, okay, so I came out with that black scarf around my waist, uh -huh. tied in the front like a um okay so i actually i studied like uh martial arts for oh i didn't know that yeah for about four years and when when you changed your name 
um, and we're going by um, Ray for a bit, R-E-I, that is a big thing in martial arts, right? That means to bow, basically. Like, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's cool. And when you change your name to Ray, that's the first thing I thought was like, oh, right. That's, it's, it's kind of a sacred thing. Yeah. And, um, and so somehow I, I was going to wear this, I was going to wear the, the scarf um, and just use it as a, sort of a prop, like even at the end so that we could both hold on to it. <laughs> yeah. Bow social distancing bow. Right. Social distancing bow. But, um, but then as I got out there and I realized like, okay, if, if I'm going to, this is like, now it's starting to look like it's a thing, you know, me sitting in the middle of this thing and to, to go ahead and put your head down. And I was, I was sitting in the way that we sit when you're, before you bow, before you start a, a kata or do some sort of exercise. Anyway, so, um, and that's how you tie the, um, the belt is in front, like, right? And, and you tie it in a certain way. So I tied it in a certain way and I had no, no intention of wearing it around my waist um, going out, but I thought, why not? I, mean, I had it, I was wearing it around my neck the whole time. And then just before I went out, I tied it in a knot. I thought, okay, this is, why not? We're doing this. So, okay, whatever. And then um, I had the idea of using the scarf to, um, to, uh, to have it around one's waist is for me, sort of a feminine uh, thing, just sort of like defining the waist. And obviously that's not, has nothing to do with martial arts because that's anybody. But I guess for myself, I see it as sort of that, the sort of the adult uh, female body is having that. And, and the body changing in many ways, um, for me, the biggest um, change my body made was from um, a child into an adult. And it was hard for me. <laughs> I was one who did not necessarily want to grow up. And um, so I thought about that. And then I thought about this the concept of binding. Um, I have a... Um, um, I have a nephew who's trans, um, and and this this that that sort of concept of of I used to wear a lot of very loose clothes. I just didn't. I, it wasn't like I wanted to be. I was. I'm. I guess cisgender, but um, I'm comfortable in my body. But I was not comfortable with being an adult. So I just I just kind of hid myself for a very long time in the way that I dressed and whatever. But I, so I just thought, okay, what if I just did that? Like pulled this thing that's quite tight around my waist, like up around my chest and, um, and put the thing in the back. Cause I don't know. I just thought, um, that was, that's, that was my, um, you know, my pre adolescent body anyway. So that's kind of what that was. That's really interesting because I, I was wondering what that was and uh, that makes a lot of sense because as I was sitting there I was trying to figure out like and my, my original thought was oh that's just a part of the like the the like suit you're wearing you just like had it tied down there for convenience and you forgot to put it up and you're like oh no and you remembered halfway through but then after that movement you took it down again and I was like wait what <laughs> hold on um so that makes a lot of sense thank you for telling me that's sure. interesting. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I don't feel like I could make a comment about, about the, uh, not being, um, cisgender, but I do remember my nephew, um, binding, and I remember that being a, uh, something that, um, felt very, <laughs> I never did it before. Yeah before last night. Anyway, yeah. But yeah, and then I played it on the Wagner tuba because that to me is, is a, uh, is, is, is gender neutral. Wagner tuba, okay, I never thought of that. <laughs> That's interesting. Tuba, yeah, it's gender neutral to me. That's, now that you've brought this up, just out of curiosity, uh, do you think the horn is a masculine or feminine coded instrument? I'm curious to see if we agree on this. <laughs> well, I would say of the brass instruments, it's the most feminine looking and that it is the least phallic. Phallic being defined as anything 
taller than it is wide, which is <laughs> a pretty loose definition. You know, um, it's so beautiful and it's uh, it's very, I mean, I see it as, is, I, 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 I'm going to say I identify with it. So I'm going to say it's, um, I identify with it as a feminine thing. Yeah, good. Me too. Um, I think the, the horn is a very feminine instrument. It's, I'm just looking at it right now. It's so beautiful. Yeah, not just aesthetically, but like in terms of its tone, like all of its, and not, not to be like stere stereotyping, but like its emotional range mm -hmm. isn't necessarily that associated with typically masculine traits in my mind. Yeah. So like, um, even like when it's playing in like a large, like heroic context, it conveys that very differently than something like a trumpet or a trombone. Yeah. Um, which is interesting that, that you brought that up then, because uh, that's always how I, I think about it too. Um, it, it yeah, it, because it's a, it's a signaling instrument, but it's not uh, like a bugle is, is more like a signal to war. And the, the hunting thing is, the hunt is, an, uh, I would say is kind of a masculine thing, but the, the calling and the, is, I, I suppose in like its original form as a hunting horn, it's probably more of a masculine thing, but I think in its like current orchestral iteration yeah. where it's kind of grown out of that. Yeah, um, and even in the, in, even in the, in the deeper um, notes, even in the registers that I can't sing in, it's not, it's low, the instrument is lower than my voice, but um, I can feel even in the low notes, there's so many high overtones. Yeah, it sounds more like the the cello in the low register, which I think of as another like phone encoded instrument. Yeah. Um, as opposed to something like a trombone, you know, that sounds virtually identical to a male voice in the same register. Well, bass trombone more. But okay, so um, so I went from that mm -hmm. thing. I think I wore it during number five. Yes, uh, you did it for for yeah. two movements, and then you took it off. Okay, so that was for me, and my notes, I, I think I had thought about playing it on Wagner tuba, um, and, and stepping out of the circle, right, because that's the graphic, I'm going to hold this up, and that's the graphic, and then, um, and I think that I had envisioned maybe talking through the, the thing, playing and talking at the same time, which mm -hmm. is something I've, I've done before, and I just I think it's really cool, because no one can really understand what you're saying, but I find that, in general, nobody can understand what I'm saying, so. <laughs> that's one of the things that makes one feel alone is when one is talking and being huh. yeah me so anyway so i said okay um but i see now that i did not i didn't talk at all and i think i got over there i don't know what i don't know what i did i was sit kneeling i believe yeah i'm trying to remember yeah. yes i do remember you played something that was a lot more like in the character of the second movement in, in that it was definitely tonal oh. and had it was centered around like a do me ti um lay sort of relationship okay. um and yeah the other thing was that this one was like a perfect form you know it was you played you played a motif and okay. you played it virtually the same and then you had a section that was just completely different uh, it was, you went from like a low, reg like medium low register, lyrical sort of thing mm -hmm. into this like screamy, like r rippy type thing. Okay. And then you played the original motif again. And it was just like perfectly like divided proportions. And it was, that was another one that I was like, did she write that out? What? <laughs> What's going on? You know what? If stuff works like that, I'm going to say, you know what that is? Okay. Because you, you can't, I, I was, I had no idea, like, you know, consciously like I wasn't making decisions I was just trying to be in it and obviously if it's a form like that if, if I was adhering to any form because that's my training that's yeah all we, that's all we do okay cool and then um, yeah, I have no I am not remembering much okay so and then we had to number six okay this was the second one to uh make me choke up <laughs> this is called fire yeah and it's um and I played this on the natural horn because um, it is the most terrifying sound. Oh, yeah. It was, I used the D crook, which is- Okay, I was wondering. Yeah. I was wondering I what he was saying. In any tonality, but it is the most terrifying sound when it's played really loud. A horn that, that, a hand horn that long 
is generally becomes immediately part of the woodwind family. It's a very mm -hmm. woody sound. And so um, I was, this one said, can I just read the text? Sure. Second? The first men looked upon the wildfire and saw God. Thus the fire God gazed back for the first time. Play him music, lest he consume us all before the day comes. And um, so I just stood up and that is a terrifying, again, no pressure, <laughs> to play to play to a fire god so that, so that he will not consume us is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a big thing. And this graphic has a lot of um, echoes in it. To me, that's what those look like. Mm -hmm. um, they're also a little bit tree-like for me. And um, it's a wildfire. So I just got up and I just, I just tried to go there and just be terrified. And, and I was pleading with the fire god not to consume us, not to consume me. Um, I really felt it. I really felt yeah. it. This was another one of those movements that like um, you you played exactly like I would have. After. Well, not exactly, exactly, but like you hit all the major emotional points that I personally put into the score for myself. Okay. And at the risk of like divulging too much about this piece, there's a lot of elements of like, because the piece is written on four different narrative arcs over four different time scales. Okay. And one of them deals with a lot of like prehistory and um, sort of like proto-religion and the way that we developed concepts of spirituality and the, how that developed into paganism and then into all the religions of the world. And um, that that is exactly the emotion that I tried to have in this one. Something that's not understood, but that's absolutely terrifying. But that at the same time is like, you have to have a relationship with, you know what I mean? Um, and so to hear, like, I had never heard a natural horn playing at that volume before, ever. And it sounded like, um, like a missile siren. And that's what really, like, screwed me over, because um, I have, I've been in a situation where I've heard a missile siren before, like, in a like, this is not a drill situation. I, short story about me, I was in Hawaii when the uh, nuclear alarm system went off at one time and they told us all that there was an ICBM headed for us and we had to wait for three hours in the basement until they gave us the all clear genuinely thinking we were going to die and all the I was going um, and it was the loudest thing I'd ever heard and uh, that's what that sounded like and but like not like that because it wasn't being played over speakers it wasn't it was a horn you know what I mean yeah. and it was interspersed by these really emotional like repeated almost like chant like segments that like absolutely you you got into the headspace of like everything that I had in mind for that which is absolutely fantastic because it sounded like you came from it from a sort of a different angle but you ended up at very much the same place yeah well and and again that that sound I had not prepared like I hadn't practiced d horn um the reason I chose d is because it's actually one of my favorite keys but you know Me too. <laughs> That, that um, the C horn, that solo in uh, Brahms' first symphony, mm -hmm. I'm, at, I'm singing, I'm like, da, da, dee, da, dee, da, da. I don't know what key I'm in, but the, um, it's on, on natural horn, it's very long horn, C horn is super long, and we're taught in, in, on modern instruments to play it really loud, but if you try and play it really loud on C horn, it starts to just sound really woody, and it'll start to back up. And like, so I thought I'm gonna, I want that sound for that, but not having done it before in the hall. As soon as I did it, I was like, oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I scared myself, you know? And it was one of those situations where like, cause I have very sensitive ears. I wanted to cover my ears cause like it physically hurt. But at the same time I didn't because I wanted to experience it. And, um, and every time, even after you'd done that, that like initial blast, like five times, it continued to scare me each time, you know, it was really fantastic and effective. And I hope the recording like picked up the full like range of what you did with that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm so glad that worked. Okay. So number seven, Song from Earth. Um, this one, I, um, this one was hard. Join us in a joke. Let us 
laugh together as one family. And I thought about that as um, sort of like the uh, uh, being together. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. just the thing about playing two instruments at the same time is also um, it's something that I, cracks me up and I'd actually never done it before. That I actually had tried to play before with two mouthpieces. Uh -huh. I'd never done that before. And well, then, you made me laugh, so. Okay, okay. Um, the entire time, I uh, I don't know if you know of this, but there's a like alt rock band from like the 80s called Coliseum. Um, and they have a saxophone player named Dick Hextel Smith, who's really famous for playing two saxophones at the same time. So he plays an alto out of one side of his mouth and a soprano out of the other side. And he only plays with one hand on each. I think one of them's a left-handed instrument, the other is right-handed. And that's what I thought of. But like, it completely didn't work. You know what I mean? And I think like it wasn't supposed to, you know, so it was sort of comical in that perspective, which like I felt bad for laughing, but at the same time, like, you know... <laughs> I, I was trying to make a joke. There was a guy at the at Fisherman's Wharf when I was a kid who played two trumpets. Oh my god! Like this. That guy's got a hustle. Yeah, right. That's the first time I'd seen that, but I'm sure he was long gone by the time you were growing up there. But um, yeah, but that was a yeah. Okay, well, so okay, that's what it was. What it was. <laughs> okay, so number eight is called First Snow. Mm -hmm. um, Count your heartbeats, and this is the this was sort of the um, the uh, inspiration for my circle, which had five horns. It's a five pointed star. Mm -hmm. All these other things in between it, and and uh, anyway, this I just did with my um, bells, and I was trying to make uh, okay. So the inside says, I often wonder. If snowflakes feel themselves falling, or if the world simply rises among them, which I just, what an amazing image because snowflakes you feel are so um, delicate and light, weightless, and, um, fragile and, and temporary, like they're going to just melt at any second. And then here comes the, the world rising among them, having this enormous mass which is the earth like coming up to meet this little fragile thing. It's like a, you know, the wind blows here and there. And I thought, God, you know, like that's, that's almost like our ego, you know, like a, a child's ego or even a human's ego to believe that, that we are somehow the earth is here for us, you know, when in fact we're just, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, I just, I just love that image of the world coming up and rising among us, us, we who are so unimportant and have to like scream at a fire god to not consume us. Do you know what I mean? That's that's, that's so funny because, and again, at the risk of divulging what I wrote, that's actually almost exactly opposite what my thought was with writing that. Um, so that's that's so interesting that we we found two different like angles of approach in the same little right. bit. Yeah. So I don't know the bells. I just wanted to hear like some sort of. I wanted to hear a different kind of sound, and. Um, yeah, when you did that, I was like, "Oh my god, what?" <laughs> I hope she's not attached to those bells. <laughs> was, um, but you I know, was like, all these things are just tools. I mean, if they're not there to make noise, I don't. Do you know what I mean? I felt like yeah. I was getting the sound room I wanted. And I was experimenting. I had no idea. I had not done that before. To, to, to use a bell in that way. Never done that. So it, I, I really took your uh, advice there and just just came in like whatever. Whatever's going to happen. And it was interesting to hear as well because like the only time you hear like that metal on metal clank is immediately followed by, oh shit, when you're working with your horns, you know? So like actually hear it in a not like, oh shit situation was really interesting. And to actually get to hear the like percussive resonance of yeah. the instrument. Can I, can I tell you something else? When sure. I started that metallic sound, um, cause I, I had thought it'd be like lighter, but then I heard when I could hear like, wow, this is really making a lot of noise. And then, um, I, um, again, starting about the fire God and then this earth rising with this 
snowflakes and like the molten thing and then like you know this this concept of, of forging metal you know mm -hmm. there's just a lot of heat and it's a very violent act to make a brass instrument it's just <laughs> oh my horn i'm like really have you seen one made either the bell is either being hammered or being extruded you know on a on a mandrel like that and oh god yeah and so it's just, these are not delicate instruments i mean they're expensive yeah but they're not <laughs> they're not uh I don't, I don't. And so as I was doing that, I was thinking like, yeah, yeah, screw it. <laughs> That's the dolls. I'll just have someone iron them out. Then it's not a, um, it's not a violin or some sort of precious thing. Anyway, so that's what that one was. Yeah. I, I remember enjoying it. I don't remember really entirely what I did, but I, I'm just telling Jonah to come like with his lesson. Little tips too. Um, Oh, that's right. Uh, do you have somewhere else you need to be? Or? No, I have um, Jonas coming for his lesson, but I'm just trying to come late. Okay. Is that all right? You, oh, yeah, sure. So number nine is called Air. And um, this one says, on Neptune, they call methane air. I wish to see it someday. And the graphic looks like this. And, um, well... How, what incredible image is that? <laughs> methane. And then to say, I wish to see it. Well, what, okay, do you want to see the methane? Or do you want to see Neptune? You know I mean, I was sitting there like, okay, because air or methane, you know what I'm saying? It's like, a, I don't know. I just, I just love this idea. And I decided to do it on my um, uh, natural horn. And I... I thought maybe I would just make these um, airy sounds on it. Oh, that's right. I was trying to remember this movement. And uh, this is the one that you, you flipped your mouthpiece mm -hmm. upside down, right? Yeah. Which makes such a cool sound. It's oh, like, yeah. It's like, I don't, I don't, it sounds really loud to me when I'm doing it. But um, yeah, and so I just messed around with my mouthpiece uh, inverted and, um, and just made air sounds. And this reminded me of... Uh, which I, while I was sitting there, and I was sitting differently than I had sat before, as I recall, um, that was not, I didn't have a plan for that, but I think I was sitting kind of like sideways with my legs to, the, to my side. And um, once I started, and it started, it started to sound like breath more than, more than anything to me. Um, I thought about this installation, this art installation, when I was in uh, Vienna, one time I went to one, you know, the big gate and they had a, an art installation where it was just speakers. It was winter, it was January and it was really cold. And there was like this, <laughs> it was just speakers breathing. And it sounded like, like this huge monster breathing. Oh, wow. And it was like, like it's creepy. Was like what, where's this coming from? And people would walk through it and it would go off, you know, and you walk back. I don't know. 45 minutes there listening to this thing breathe <laughs> i just thought of that when i was out there and and then i think i was making higher pitch sounds anyway okay so then we have uh number 10 unless you had something to say about that i don't know oh no that was that was good okay uh number 10 is was called uh, is called song for rest <laughs> this is the one that got interrupted <laughs> okay and i had i at some point i saw someone like um Walk by. Yeah, so so what happened was I'm sitting there and I'm listening to you essentially play the, the tuba like a didgeridoo. I was like, wow, that's so cool. And um, and then I hear keys in the back of the chapel. And I go, oh no, who is that? And I see out of the corner of my eye a security guard just walking down the aisle. And she walked backstage and I was like, okay, she's gone. And then the door opens again and she walks back out. And she walks like across the front of the stage like immediately in front of you and then and then she left but the entire time her keys were going clink 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 awesome i hope she doesn't expect to get paid oh yeah <laughs> um i just remember seeing uh something like walk by the front of the stage just at the edge of the stage i had no memory of anything else but um if the keys the keys were clanking i didn't hear it because it's funny because i was clanking the keys on the tuba right yeah yeah, and this one I did had no idea what to do. I 
was trying I was thinking about this one says play a long a sound long and gentle make it as beautiful as can be feel it meditate upon it make that one note sing like the tender music of older days and it's very long the, the time cue is very long it's the longest piece in the cycle yeah and it's a taka so at the end of it anyway so i was i got up there and i was thinking i was standing i think i was standing and then i couldn't i had no idea what i was going to do not none at all no idea no idea i thought maybe at a certain point um i might try polyphonics i don't remember if i did that or not yeah you did a lot and circular breathing which is why i compared it to didgeridoo um you circular breathe the entire thing i don't think you stopped playing once Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't really remember this one, but um, I just was trying to, to think about this like one note and then have everything come from that. And then it's a taka to this next one, which is number 11 called Song for Morning. The, the marquee sheet looks like this. I should say score, but it's the score says scream in, in small letters and then under song for morning it says until it hurts. Then keep going. So um yeah, I I didn't know I didn't have anything written on this. I did not know I didn't have a plan for this one. And uh so I decided um well I'm just gonna maybe scream again and um I remembered, remember the first time I did, I thought I was going to scream through one of the bells, mm -hmm. you know? And then I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do the, um, maybe I'll use this to the al alphorn, the lower part of the bells, the alphorn. Uh -huh. It was behind. And, but yeah. I was just singing backwards. Turning around and like turning your back to the audience was very interesting because that's n not something that ever gets done in performance of any kind and so whenever something like that happens in a staged performance it is immediately noticeable and it's a very large indicator and it casts a very specific like light on whatever is going on um and i suppose that contrast really helped set that apart from when you did the singing at the beginning um, because that one you were in looking forward and interacting with right. where the audience would have been. This one, it was like you isolated yourself completely, um, which is also something that I had in mind when writing this movement, you know? Um, well, and that, and, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say the, the lowercase scream, like it was so small on the page. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, and so maybe the, the turning backwards, I'm like, I, it's, it's a scream, but to play would be to, to make it softer would be to, I mean, to scream that small and to, and until it hurts and to keep going is kind of, it's kind of a definite, it's definitely a contradiction to me. Like if the thing is a scream, you know, like big font or something, but I think, the, I think turning backwards was like, like, I need like a private moment or like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want anyone to hear this, but I'm going to do this. Like, I had to make it, uh, like, to separate. I don't know. That's fascinating. That, um, I actually didn't think about that. When I, um, I, I want to talk about this. You know what, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say it. Um, when I was writing it, I wasn't, I was less con intent on the, the text being small and more on the empty part of this page being big. Um, which I, I think, again, you ended up in a similar spot just by a different, right. looking at a different thing, you know? Um, so it's actually, this would be the space to fill, in a way. Is that what you mean? No comment. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> Earth. And this one is about the, uh, well, it's about a lot of things. This one has quite, a, I'll just go ahead and read it. Look back at all you have left behind. Everyone you know, everyone you love, everyone you've ever heard of, every homo sapiens, every life, 
every death, every memory is so far away on a blue speck of dust within that speck of light, slowly fading into the hungry void, our speck. Now is not the time for tears. Look ahead to all the new stars. And I just love this. And the, the thought, um, our, our speck, you know, our blue planet, our blue speck, and within that speck of light, slowly fading into the hungry void. Yeah, I just love this one. And I was just really, I played this on the soprano horn because I felt it was, uh, that sound is the most, uh, to me, sort of celestial, not in terms of like music of the spheres, but in terms of like bright, bright yeah. the light coming back. And, and so I just, I just was thinking about that speck and the, and the, and the score is, is um, lots of dashes on it or like this sort of chick, 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 like the active and that was that. Yeah, this one is like of the movements that I wrote, like in their score presentation. This one is my favorite. Uh, I actually, I'm part of like an online like uh, site for poetry sharing and critiquing. And I actually put that, the instructions from this movement up as their own separate poem, just because I loved it so much. But, um, and this is because I mentioned, you know, there were some where like our interpretations lined up. This is one where you played something completely different than what I had in mind, which is why I like listening to it. This is one of the ones where I got to really be like an audience member and try to figure out what was going on like in your compositional mind because I had almost like no insight into it. Yeah. Well, this one, this one, I, I mean, I was towards the, towards the end, but it, I, uh, that's kind of the sound that of uh, like um, I imagine like if the the specs are I don't know if, if the uh, I felt it was um, they were I I had intended to to do something like this I, like I don't even know what that means. But somehow when I got up there playing, I, I started to feel like all those specks within the speck of light, everything, everyone you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like all this like energy out there on this speck that's disappearing into a hungry void. Like how do those specks communicate? What does that sound like? Ooh, interesting. That's what you... I imagine those, the sound of a speck. Yeah. So you, you took the same train as me. You just got off at a very different spot. That's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And then 13 is night sleep. Yeah. However long to not feel rushed. I love that instruction. I just wish that I could, I wish that, I wish that that was my instruction for life. <laughs> to not feel rushed. And then it says, remember that night long ago. And um, that's what the graphic is. I have no memory of playing that. Uh, you did that one on Alphorn again. Uh, this one sounded much more like a traditional Alphorn sound. Um, although uh, it was much more and you, you did something that I've thought about a lot in that you played the Alphorn, again, more like a didgeridoo. There were some polyphonics, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, you also circular breathed uh, in a couple of spots, uh, and which I found particularly inter interesting because, like, you know, we find, like, these ancient, like, horns made out of bronze in Northern Europe that we think were played a lot like the didgeridoo, you know? It's just they haven't been played in 5,000 years, so we don't actually know what they sound like. And there are bands that have started like reviving the instrument in their performance, and that's more kind of in line with the playing technique that they used. So that was a very interesting as well. I'm curious, what were you thinking about? Because I wrote that, I think like this, this movement specifically was one of the ones that I meant. This one and movement for body were specifically like personally geared. Um, mm. And I, I'm curious to see what this one was for you if you're comfortable with sharing that. Yeah, well, uh, um, so, oh, you know, and the th thing is like, I had made some notes, like maybe play it on this instrument, 
played on this instrument, you know, just to make sure I get all the instruments covered, whatever. Some that I thought might match. I didn't write anything for this one. But um, the nightscape is then sort of, we've done that one with the dawn, obviously. And I might have been descending, ascending in the dawn one. I was thinking that the evening thing, maybe descending, I'm not even sure. But I was imagining the sun setting. And remember, remember that night long ago. And of course, oh my God, what night? was that and it was just it wasn't even a specific night it was just the um emotion from that night long ago and good <laughs> yeah and not to feel rushed you know that's great and so that was the permission i gave myself in this one yeah because yeah. that's i i specifically like wanted the performer in that way sort of to find a specific emotion that that reminded them of yeah. but specifically not I didn't code it to a specific emotion like most of them I did but this one not in that I didn't specify whether it was a good night or a bad night right. and uh, I in your case I actually couldn't tell uh, which was made it even more interesting uh, for me to to listen for it but um, I yeah, this is one of the ones that I feel like I I can't really hear other people's perspectives like I can with others. Yeah. Well, and um, I'm going to say the emotion that you, you could identify it is, um, I can. Do you, you want me to tell you? Sure, if you're comfortable with that. It was the first time in my life that I had felt like I, it was, well, you know, developmentally we call it like parallel play in the sandbox or something where you're sort of like benignly interested in what the other person's doing, but not interfering or not, do you know what I'm saying? And you're, uh -huh. It's not imitative, it's not reactive. And, uh, you know, in chamber music and music, we, and in improvisation, certainly, you know, if there's more than one person, you can say what you want. At a certain point, it's going to be canonic, or it's going to be reactive, or you're either leading or following, or you're this or that, or it's, you know what I mean? You can, it's so hard to, to, even if you say, okay, I'm going to completely shut out this other sound, and I'm just going to improvise. I'm just going to be in my own thing. Well, your own thing can't be that if someone else is playing with you. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like so. So you. So even you know. It's even if you're, if you're saying, "I'm not going to listen to you." That is that is a very active process. Yeah. Definitely. You're okay. So so other people are around. We have to relate to each other. That's what humans do. And it's exhausting. <laughs> Yeah. And um, it was just, it was like, a, it was, the emotion was of not feeling um, I'd always only felt like this um, by myself. I had to be alone. I couldn't be around someone else without ah, being pulled out of myself in some way or you know what I mean yeah and so uh, and so this was this experience where I was with another person and it, it wasn't it was really neither here nor there the, the person was a friend and reading I was reading do you know what I mean it was just this moment where I felt like with another person without um, being engaged or being pulled out of myself. Like I felt like for the first time, I, some people call them borders. We have a joke that my, we call my family, families without borders. <laughs> but, but this was a great moment for me. And it was one in which I felt, I did not feel rushed. I didn't feel instructed. I didn't feel criticized for good or bad. I didn't feel performative. I didn't feel like, I just felt, 
I just was. Like I was just there on the blue speck, floating through space. That's so fascinating because that's so fascinating because that's not like if you were to give me like a pen and paper and ask me to write down every possible emotional state I could think of, <laughs> that's not one that I would come up with, even given like a million years of trying. <laughs> Which is why um thank you for doing that. You know, that's something very uniquely you, I suppose. And that's the sort of thing that I feel like I was really looking for with a piece like this, is that like, and I've, I've gearing more and more towards this type of writing because it, it seems like such a shame to me as a composer to think of my performers just as like music reproducers, you know what I mean? I feel like that's selling you guys short because every performer that I've met is either a brilliant musical mind or is burnt out. Um, and it's like, I feel like both of those things, well, one of them could be avoided and the other can be put to good use if given the right situation, which is why, and I feel like that's like a prime example of that. So thank you so much. Well, and thanks for giving me that room. Oh. <laughs> I, I was trying to describe this to someone as like what this piece was and, and um, I suggest it was a little bit like um, sort of like guided improv maybe yeah that's exactly that's the exact phrase that i've used oh, okay okay or but in a certain way as a musician i'm coming at it not it is more like a guided visualization and then what that visualization sounds like interesting yeah okay and then we're at party 14 mm -hmm. and this one um it starts with this the round and then it slowly turns into this sharp edged um square and um, a rectangle and um, and so this one I sort of play on my uh, Schmidt this was a care of the well and it's a I, I didn't think of it till I did I looked at this one again because it hadn't made any notes I had no idea what to do and then I thought oh well I haven't played that horn and I I've been working with all these bells you know before and so I loosened the bell and I thought, this is actually a parting. Like if I part the spell from the horn. Yeah, which that's fascinating because like, and I've, again, as a composer, always looking for new sounds. I've thought about the sound of a unscrewed screw bell horn a lot because like that's a sound that like everybody who owns a screw bell horn has played a lot, but like never gets called for. And it's really just its own thing sort of kind of on the line between horn and trombone. And uh, so that was really fascinating. Also the choice of instrument, because like, if I remember correctly, like as, as in terms of like a performer musician relationship, um, a, a performer instrument relationship, uh, the Schmidt is not the horn you're most comfortable with. Um, but it is in like, it's, it's a giant like compromise, you know, but um, at the same time, like you have it and you, you play it a lot, which is why like, I genuinely wasn't surprised that you saved it for the very end. Um, because like when I walked in and I sat down before you started playing, I thought that that was the one you're going to be playing most because that's the one I see you play like 95% of the time. Yeah. And then once you started playing and I started realizing that each of the instruments had a specific emotional connotation for you, I was like, oh, that one's, that one's only going to be played once or twice and it's probably going to be at the end. Um, so that was very interesting for me, I suppose, as somebody who's like been around you and heard you play a lot and um, sort of watching that play out. <laughs> Well, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, I hadn't thought of that. You know, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful horn and it's, it's really, it's easy to play. It, it's, I, I, I say that it's very versatile and not as flexible. And I think you could hear from all, playing all the other horns that it's even particularly like the gyre or that the natural horn. It's just the, the sounds or the range of the sound is so much you can you can put so much more into the sound. Yeah, I, and I, maybe I shouldn't put short, but that's been my experience playing it. And I, it for me, it is my work horn. It's like the all-terrain vehicle, yeah. <laughs> it's assault weapon. And um, yeah, if you can do anything, it's got a high F attachment. It's really great. But um, yeah, so maybe it was kind of like a waking me get get out of your own like. Yeah. <laughs> back into the real world like all right get back to work whatever you know what 
Sophie, it was really fun. I really enjoyed doing it. Thank you. And like, I feel like that's an experience that I probably won't get to feel much, if at all, ever again, you know, of, of being both in like the driver's seat and in a like right. audience seat. And it was just really special, I suppose. Well, thanks. And thanks for being there. It was good to have a... Um, thank you so much for doing it and for, for letting me be there, you know. Absolutely.